On this episode of Deal and Extend, we answer some of the listeners' questions. This episode of Deal and Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean and Bitwarden. Welcome to episode 72 of Deal and Extend. Deal and Extend is a community-powered podcast. We take conversations from the Deal and community, like the discourse forums, Telegram group, Discord server, and more. We also snag topics from around the network and give you our takes. We are down to Nate, but we still have the gamer extraordinaire, Matt. How are you doing this week? I'm not doing too bad myself. How about you, Wendy? I'm doing pretty good. You up to anything fun? Me? No, never. I would never play lots of video games. Never. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that positive reinforcement. Last couple of episodes, I mentioned that I got new machine. It's an Asus Tough, whatever, typical OEM designation with a bunch of numbers and letter combinations. It's a RTX 3050 Ti, which is their one step above entry RTX cards for the 3000 series. It originally shipped with Windows. I knew can pave that into oblivion. Had some issues with Manjaro. I'm not sure if it was Manjaro or just hardware related specifically. I'm currently running Garuda Linux on it, which is working fine until Arch bites me in the butt again. Live and learn. Or just watch and repeat as I currently keep doing by installing Arch. You like pain. I like pain. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when Nate says he likes OpenSUSE and it's totally unhealthy. So I've been trying out a bunch of different games on Proton specifically with this card. A lot of the games are not like crazy as far as the system requirements. I've not been trying super high tier current gen game. These are pretty old games. And most of these, ironically enough, when you're on a Linux system and you see Microsoft Game Studios as the pop-up, yes, it's pretty entertaining. So one of the games was actually an Xbox One game. I believe your daughter has this game, Wendy. It is ReCore. Basically a Uncharted meets Tomb Raider, but more of a post-apocalyptic setting with something more like like enslaved or Horizon Zero Dawn kind of vibe to it. So it's a lot more desert planets and that kind of stuff. So far, that has been running really good. Did try a few native games. One of them that's my favorite right now that I've been playing a lot is Battletech. Battletech is really cool because I'm a big mech guy. Like I like robots and all that stuff. Native game runs great. Rise, Son of Rome. This is a Crytek game. This is like the big promotional game that he used for the original Xbox One when it came out. Like, this is the gotta get game. It runs great on Linux <laughs> and it wasn't designed for it. That's the thing that I love about a lot of this Proton stuff. Just to be that guy, I played the Halo Master Chief Collection. Other than the online, which I'm going to give Microsoft credit here. Generically, the online does not work because it has EAC or easy anti-cheat. So you can't play, generically speaking, online. However, they do give you the option to disable EAC. Wow. So you can at least play multiplayer and unranked multiplayer and private matches and that stuff. So I will give them credit for that. And the campaign works. 85% of what most people will care about is there. Nice. That is really cool to me. That is the Halo, I believe it's CE Anniversary Edition, kind of the remake of the original with the newer graphic engine. Halo 2, Halo 3, Reach, ODST, and Halo 4. I tried every single one of them. All work. And this is on the low end cart. And these are by no means of the Halo games like crazy pushing the graphics engine and all that kind of stuff. This is a limited four gig card. And I'm running Rise Son of Rome, which is the highest end game probably out of all of these. 1080p over 100 frames a second on a entry level GPU. Now, yeah, you can say that Rise is like an eight or nine year old game, but the game engine it's built on has been constantly updated. To me, that is really, really cool to see. Entry level cards have come so far compared to where they used to be, where it was like, ah, you got an integrated GPU. Good luck playing anything that is not Fruit Ninja kind of games. Yeah. <laughs> These are like tertiary kind of deals where I'll play them for an hour just to see spits and sputters and stutters and all that kind of stuff. And I haven't run into any of that. These cards, I believe, were announced back in May and they already basically work flawlessly in Linux. So for NVIDIA, that's really, really good. That is definitely awesome. It's nice to see these lower end graphics cards and pro on coming together so well to make such a great gaming experience on Linux. Definitely. That's the thing that I've been really enjoying. Obviously, there's all the talk about Proton because of the Steam Deck and everything else. This gives me a lot of hope for it. While I've been playing games, what have you not been playing, Wendy? I know. I said I was going to play Kill It With Fire before we chatted again on the live show last week. And well, uh, 
I still haven't gotten around to be able to sit down and play a game. Though I did play some games at MegaFest with the whole crew. So I did get some game time in. I just haven't got around to playing Kill It With Fire yet. It's such a crazy busy time of year as different stuff that we do as a family every year is picking up in fall time. We've got some school stuff starting up again and just trying to juggle all of those different things. Getting even 10 minutes to sit down and start a game with just hasn't happened unless it is on my schedule as part of the network. So I'm saying next week, I will tell you how I feel about Kill It With Fire. And this time you actually need to hold me to it. I expect several messages from you this week, Matt, asking if I've played the game yet. Like I already got to do that with Michael. Why do I have to do that with you now too? (laughs) Because if you don't, who knows when I'll actually get it done. Okay, I'll give you that one. In fairness, as you said, you did play a few video games. One of them was Zenotic, and you're not much of an FPS person. I am horrible at FPS games, like absolutely horrible. And if anybody was listening to the stream, you might have heard some of my kids in the background as they're like, mom, you're so bad at this. Mom, this isn't your kind of game. And I'm like, I know, I know I don't play these on a regular basis. Like the only time I play FPS games is when we do Game Fest stuff on the network. Other than that, I pretty much stay away from them because I'm absolutely horrible. Just horrible horrible at them i did frag ryan though so that made my day <laughs> you are correct because we played zenotic specifically that was the one me and wendy played together mostly because i had to drop out afterward our time on zenotic was up fragging ryan and michael is quite fun <laughs> yes it is next time i'm just gonna say ryan you wanted all the props to the servers maybe next time you can make it so that after like four or five kills people won't get booted yeah the server definitely needs to be updated or worked on for the dln zenotic server it was having some serious issues and i was actually doing pretty good on a few kills there for a bit and every time like my score was looking really good i get kicked out i'm starting to wonder if this wasn't something that ryan was doing deliberately he was always in the top but never exactly. the top so he was trying to make it look like it probably wasn't i'm still bad just saying. it wouldn't have made a difference i still probably would have been towards the bottom but i could have had a higher score than what it showed way to go ryan you're like rocco you and that aimbot you're just able to boot people <laughs> off the server instead. This episode of Deal and Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new managed MongoDB service, which is a fully managed database as a service. With MongoDB, you can focus more on building scalable, high performance apps and less on maintaining the database. Simply offload your MongoDB administration to DigitalOcean and let them handle the provisioning, managing, scaling, updates, backups, and security for your clusters. DigitalOcean built this service in partnership with MongoDB Inc. And together, they have ensured that you will get access to all the latest releases of MongoDB document database as they become available. As a listener of DLN Extend podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Actually, better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN dash Mongo. Again, go to do.co slash DLN dash M-O-N-G-O and get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new Manage Mongo DB. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. Speaking of the Megafest, we had an absolute blast playing games with everyone. And as part of that, we had an Ask the Host Anything section. There were some great answers that came from that during the Megafest. But Matt and I decided that, hey, let's go back, look at some of those questions, and give our answers to ones that maybe we didn't get a chance to answer before, or ones that we just found really interesting. The first question comes from Computer Kid. If you could magically create the perfect host and show with plenty of time, would you make another DLN show, YouTube channel? What would it be about? Uh, The perfect host. You already have me. You're set. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) 
Remember how we make fun of Michael and, you know, say we don't compliment him too much or his hair won't fit on his head? Are we going to have to start putting that logic to you too now? You've been hanging out with Michael and hardware addicts too much. I couldn't help myself. I just had to. Touche. I'll give you that. I don't think I can ask for a perfect host because all the hosts and this is going to give Michael a bigger head than he has already. Sometimes I think the hosts that are on the shows fit the shows already. We all bring a unique and interesting perspective to Lennox and kind of the approach. We're all different levels as far as what we expect and what we look for in the system. As far as perfect hosts, it's the group that makes the whole kind of situation there. As far as what I would do for a show, I'd pretty much do all the shows that I already want to do. I have a gaming show you now with Game Sphere that I do. Michael's episode will finally be coming out. I had to run on Michael time. So the nice thing with this network is there is no real limitation on what you can do. How much time you decide to put into it is really up to you. Do you have a lot? Do you not have a lot? That is, I think, really a kind of a freeing thing. How you do it, Wendy, I have no idea between two shows and whatnot. You edit this one, got to deal with all that nonsense. And you're a mom and you have your own job. Props to you. Life is busy for sure. To be fair, for hardware addicts, I read the show notes that Ryan puts together and then I decide whatever we're doing for Camera Corner. That show is pretty simple. For this show, you're usually doing the show notes. We're deciding what the main topic is together some days, some Sometimes you're picking it. Sometimes Nate's picking it. Like there's a shared load, I guess you could say, for getting the podcast in and up and together. And then, yeah, most weeks I'm editing the show. It's been really interesting to learn how to edit. And then through the whole stuff going on with Audacity and the upcoming sub tenacity, it has given me something else to talk about as part of show content as well. Perfect hosts. I'm definitely with you on this one. I don't want a robot of a person. It is so nice to be able to chat with people at different levels of Linux or like on Hardware Addicts. We have different levels of hardware knowledge, the amount of money that we're willing to spend on hardware. Ryan is more like the, oh my gosh, this thing just came out and what can I do to get it now? And I'm more of the, I absolutely love hardware, but I am not going to spend money on it unless I see that there's a good cost to performance ratio that makes it worth it for me to buy. And then we have Michael who rarely buys hardware, though he's been doing amazing lately. And then once he gets it, it can sit on the shelf for like two or three months. And that dynamic in that show, I think really provides good content because we all are in a different place and we can have great conversations about it. That happens here on this show too. That happens on Destination Linux. I don't think there's any of the shows out there where there isn't good conversation because we are all different. And I guess that would be the perfect host. I don't want someone who's just like me. I want somebody who has different opinions and that we get along well enough that we can talk about what those differences are and why we feel that way. That organic nature, willingness to just like sometimes hear an approach that you might not normally take. We make the joke about CLI versus GUI. I tend to be more in the minority in the group, shall we say, Yes. when it comes to my approach to Linux and computing as a whole. I can just feel you roll your eyes when I talk about updating (laughs) my phone from the terminal. (laughs) Yes, I can feel that eye roll. (laughs) Which ironically I don't do because I don't run Manjaro KDE on my Pine phone. I run a mobile OS that was meant for the phone. Jokingly, of course, I know Plasma Mobile is meant for phones. I'm saying I run Ubuntu Touch as my preferred thing on the Pine phone, which everything is done through the GUI on the Pine phone with Ubuntu Touch. You can do it through the terminal, but the way it's presented is not the preferred way. That difference... And it's not even so much an eye roll, it's just like, a, eh, whatever. And that's what I like. We can disagree about what's the best way for a person to update it. Is it because the terminal is ubiquitous, but the commands are not? Pseudo app update is for Debian or, you know, whatever DNF commands are. Oh, you know, pseudo Pac-Man, TAC, capital S on a YU is for Pac-Man. It's all about how you want to experience your computing. At the end of the day, it's the core values around not just Linux, but open source stuff is what we value most. It's that core commonality that matters most. I'm not going to shun you for deciding to run proprietary stuff. I'm not going to shun you for saying that proprietary stuff's not for you if you know you want to go the more open sourcey route. Most of us are respectful to the human beings 
that are making the choices. Yes. That reflects, it, I think, in the dynamic of the shows. As much as we might poke fun at each other, I constantly make fun about Michael and you know his ability to tell time. <laughs> Michael, don't let your head get big when I say this. I do respect Michael. I even respect Ryan for as much as I troll Ryan. I know I'm going to catch flack for that one. Yes. Like you, I think it's that dynamic that really makes the shows what they are. Because even when we guest host, you know, we're on some of the other shows on the network. If you have somebody visiting our hardware addicts or we've occasionally had guest co-hosts and stuff, it brings an interesting dynamic because you still have kind of staple like expectations of, well, this person's probably going to think this way as a listener. The listener has a certain listening expectation because of based on the listen history. But if you get a guest host, are they going to match or they not? Where are they going to sit on kind of stuff? And I kind of like that almost known but unknown when you bring in somebody that isn't part of the normal group. Flow. Yeah. You could bring in Ryan or Michael into one of our conversations. Their perspective is going to be totally different than what you expect from maybe Nate or Wendy or me. Not in the same kind of bubble that we generically get in as far as like where we view stuff. That's a really cool little dynamic that I really like about the network and the shows in the network as a whole. Everyone's got a different approach to approaching the network as a whole. You couldn't have just one show. You have to do a network the way that this has been done. Because at the end of the day, this is really just a bunch of people coming together because we're all a bunch of Lennox nerds. Yes. We're also a bunch of nerds and geeks and around so many different things. When you love photography, Brian's a hardware person. Michael is more about getting into like design and that kind of stuff. That's where he likes focusing. I'm like a cross section of everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like I'm a hardware guy. I mean, you make fun of the weird hardware that I do get. Totally own it. Yes. But but on the same note, the biggest of the gamers on the network, Ryan and Jill are probably the, the other two, their go-to form of like entertainment and whatnot. And it's just right. those kind of different cross sections that we all fall into, I think really helps the network more organic and less echo chamber. Each show is different because... All of us are different. Yeah, absolutely. What about the second half of that question, which if you could do any show, what would it be? Or would you maybe expand on one of the shows that you're doing? I do the gaming show and I also do this show where I talk a lot about gaming, but I also don't focus on a lot of specifically Linux stuff until we get into that portion of the topic. Would I do a more Linux centric show? I don't know if there's enough there to, I don't want to say interest me. I don't think I would do any other shows that I'm not currently doing. The generic Linux news cycle, not going to lie. And this isn't a shot at news sites or anything. It's a lot of technical stuff that unless they're programs that I use, I generically don't care. But cool for those people who do. I just tend to be in the, I'm only going to really focus on what kind of matters and what kind of affects me. That's a very niche audience. I do understand that. So for me, it's one of those, I probably wouldn't change anything or do any more shows than I've already currently a part of or doing. I don't know about you. I really want to take on one more show. And the only reason why it hasn't happened yet is time and that is a separate camera corner i want to be able to do stuff where there's things that i've explained especially on the technical side of how parts of the camera work or how to set up shots and using all of that editing it all on linux i really want to create that show but time has been the limiting factor in just being able to get it started. One of my resolutions for this year or my guesses of things that will happen in 2021 was to have a dedicated camera corner. The year isn't over yet, but gosh dang it, we are at the end of August. And if I'm going to make that happen... I need to figure out where I can schedule that time. So if I could do one more show, it would be a show dedicated to photography and married with Linux. You can't do X without Adobe. <laughs> it's usually what you always hear. Being like, na 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 boo boo and rub it in their face. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be great to see. Exactly. And there already are some great channels out there on YouTube for editing in Darktable, editing in GIMP, or some of these other software focused. And I would like to combine not only getting the shot, but then editing it together, having it one entire package. Sometimes the hardest part is getting it right in camera and I would love to be able to share that knowledge with the rest of our community. That would be really cool to see. 
the other part of this question, what is your favorite recent Linux community initiative and why is it Pipewire? I just found that part funny. Pipewire is like Wayland to me right now. It's cool. I'll wait for it when it's in a finalized distro. Fedora is cool for those that want to use it. Just put it that way for me. If you could magically create another initiative to change things in the Linux ecosystem, what would it be? I'm trying to think of a problem that is an issue for me now that I would like to solve. And really, the only things I'd have to say that we're dealing with still on a daily basis that can be kind of a pain or a bit of a struggle would be drivers on some of the proprietary stuff like NVIDIA. So you were dealing with some of those issues. So that is getting better. I do audio stuff, but I don't do a whole lot of deep in the back end, though I think PipeWire eventually will help with that. Nate's done a lot more playing with that than I have. So I can't even say that it's my favorite, but I'm glad it is for you, computer kid. But right <laughs> now, off the top of my head, I actually can't think of anything that I'd be like, yes, this is a problem that I would love to solve right now across the entire Linux ecosystem. I generally agree. As the NVIDIA stuff, having recently done that, dealt with that, perception, I think would be the one thing I want to fix the most. And when I say perception, I mean the perception of using Linux as a whole. And I guess that's probably why I'm so more like, stop doing stuff in the terminal and show how to actually do it for normal people. The perception is we live in our own bubble. That's what hurts us. It's probably the one thing I would want to change the most if I could change anything. That's just a personal outlook because I think if you could change that perception, you would be making an innovation by changing the perception. And if you can change that perception, therefore you end up changing how that affects the Linux ecosystem because you're potentially bringing in a whole lot more new users and different user base than what is currently there for pros and cons. There was another question on Discourse that kind of follows that same line as what we've been talking about. I'm just curious because I'm pondering also where you see it all goes in another five years. This is a question that Nate addressed during the Megafest, and it'd be kind of interesting to give our perspectives on this question too. Five years can seem like an extremely short time and an extremely long time. In the case of the network, we're getting ready to celebrate the second birthday. In five years, we'll be roughly seven years old. There's a lot of things that can happen in five years based on the amazing community that we have around us the creators that we have making shows, I can really only see the network growing with more shows or the shows that we have now expanding. None of them will stay the same. The shows that you have right now at the two-year mark will probably still be here in that five years, but they won't always be structured the same. This group of people is not afraid to say, it's time to change things up just a little bit and add things or take things away to the shows. I only see us growing in general and getting stronger as a community and a network together. This is almost like, do you have a business plan kind of deal? <laughs> yeah. Five-year predictions are hard. I think in five years, we'll have probably an expanded roster of shows. The beginning shows, if you want to call it that, when the network was first started, will still be around. Just speaking for me, I started this about 13 months ago. It's been a learning experience on podcasts and everything else consistently throughout probably the last 10 years on and off. This is obviously the first, okay, we're going to do this show with this group of people consistently. <laughs> it's had its changes. Obviously, when Eric had to take a step back, we had to look at the show and see what would work, what wouldn't. Kind of had to adapt and change. We're definitely not afraid of the change. When Chris had to step away and I took on GameSphere, granted there was a couple of months hiatus, there was reasons for that. The structure significantly changed and it's not because the show didn't work. It was because what Chris wanted to do and what I wanted to do were two different things. Anybody can take, example, this show, DL Extend, and make it whatever they want. Like structure-wise, you can make it about whatever you want. It's more of a discussion platform as far as the actual show itself. Therein lies the strength of, I think, the network in and of itself. The network is still going to be around. The shows might be different. Some of the hosts might come and go. There's a lot of change that can happen in five years. As long as the spirit of why the network started 
and came together is still at its core. In five years, I don't see a problem with the network as a whole expanding and growing and bringing even more different shows and types and opinions in. Absolutely. Let's jump to something that's a little bit more game focused. Ooh, games. MHJ asked, what is everyone's first game they remember fondly? This is one of the ones that Jill gave an answer to, and I cannot wait to get your answer, Matt, because you are the gaming guru on the network. So what's the first game that you truly remember fondly? Fondly? Yes nostalgia there's a difference between remembering the first game i remember fondly because i grew up in a weird time like i'm a late 80s kid so (laughs) right you know according to nate the 80s just ended ah man when i was growing up you know i remember the atari 5200 and like the atari 2600 that was something that they had bought in my brother and sisters who were about six and nine years older than me me being the youngest i remember getting a nes and i remember the track and field game with the mario game and the duck hunt and all that stuff but i don't remember those fondly fondly to me is probably the super scope games for super nintendo Because that was really like my first console, like the one that I had, whereas the other ones were like the family consoles. And for me, there was two games. One was the original and one was the sequel. They were for the Super Scope, which was this big light gun for the uh, Super Nintendo. And it was Battle Clash and Metal Combat Falcon's Revenge. The thing that I remember about these is that they were interactive stories almost because depending on the strategies that you took in like Metal Combat, you got two different endings. And that was something that was just like blew my mind because it's like, what? (laughs) That was a new thing to have different endings. Yeah. The way it worked was one of the people get captured. You have a machine gun that you can dwindle down the bad guy's health if you shoot around him and kind of destroy all the other stuff that's incoming to you. You know, typical light gun game. You can also literally destroy and shoot through the hostage, basically. Kind of like speed as far as the movie. You shot the hostage? Yeah. (laughs) Based on that choice, you had two very different endings. The ending is different based off tactics. That for me is something that I really remember that kind of really stuck with me. There's the arcade experience of like the T2, the arcade game that had the light gun game that was in the arcades and stuff. Most people probably don't remember what arcades are at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, there actually is still one in our local mall. So they are around. I'm in the wrong area then. (laughs) Yes, you are. But that to me was probably the ones that I remember the most fondly because those were the ones that I owned. They were my first consoles, kind of like a mind blowing experience almost. And you're just like, oh, that's really cool. But the question is, what about you, Wendy? I was also a late 80s kid, or I guess I could say born in the late 80s. So I have some of those similar game consoles and game types that were around. We did have an Atari when I was really little, and I vaguely remember playing with that. I remember our first home computer that was running DOS and then putting in not the little floppy disk, the big five-inch floppy disk in order to play a game. The five inches. (laughs) Yes. The game that I remember the most vividly, and it's not a game that I actually played, but I spent a lot of time watching my younger brother play, was Sonic the Hedgehog 2, the one that brought Tails into the mix. That game was played all the time in our house when I was really little. I don't know that it's necessarily the game, but it's probably the memories of my brother in relationship to that game that I like the most. He was one of those players that his whole body would move as he's trying to play and as he's getting frustrated because he can't get through a level like he's literally shaking just shaking because he has this desire and this frustration to get through the level so that would probably be the game that I have the most fond feelings for just because it's relationship to my brother but the other one that I probably spent a lot of time playing would have to be Oregon Trail and I'm sure there's a bunch of you out there who spent your elementary days on the computer as your quote unquote, you've done good time dying in Oregon Trail. Pig disease from that era and you have died. (laughs) Exactly. It was almost like a congratulations, you are dead. Oh, well, I guess I'll start again. (laughs) Those would probably be the top two (laughs) games that I probably remember the best from my childhood. This episode of DLN Extend is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the passive manager we use and trust. 
It's the easiest, safest way for individuals, teams, businesses, and organizations to store their passwords and other vital sensitive information. Bitwarden lets you choose the authentication to access your password manager, such as PIN, master password, and adding phrases or fingerprint security, all to keep your passwords safe. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. Bitwarden is a password manager that I use and trust because Bitwarden is 100% open source. It has extensive security audits. It gives you the ability to self-host if you so choose. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. It's only $10 for a premium account, which gives you one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, and more. Make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. If you're like me, you'll want to show your appreciation by signing up for the Premium Edition, especially since the Premium Edition starts at only $10 annually. Bitwarden has saved me from getting into a serious jam numerous times. Now, you wouldn't be able to pry it from my cold, dead device. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. It's a super fun game choice with some great memories for the first game that you remember fondly. What's the game you're playing now, Matt? I picked up Astral Chain for the Switch, probably when it first came out. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a big cyberpunk fan. Futuristic, anything dystopian, kind of futuristic, anime-ish kind of game is generically what I gravitate to. They usually tell a more unique story, let's put it that way. I purchased Astral Stroll Chain for the Switch, and it is done by Platinum Games. Those that don't know who Platinum Games is, if you played Metal Gear Solid Rising Revengeance, that was a Platinum game. That's a mouthful. Or, as they're probably better known for, they made Bayonetta, which is the other game that they're known for. This is somewhat in the vein of like a Devil May Cry, so it's an action game, but it's not solely reliant on combat. It's a much more... I don't want to say easier game. It's a much more accessible action game to get into. The switching mechanics and that kind of stuff is really simplified to actually play. Again, this is kind of just the generic first couple hours that I've been playing it. Story, typical anime is going to be insane, to say the least. And the graphics look really good for a Switch game, though. I'm not going to lie. That very anime aesthetic to it that I like. From what I've seen, it takes about 10 to 15 hours to beat. So it's usually out of my wheelhouse as far as how much I'll be willing to pay for it. But I think the production values and kind of the effort that went into it makes it kind of worth it so if you can actually find it i'd kind of recommend picking it up i think it's one of the games that's probably the most underrated when it comes to the switch kind of lineup of games because it's a switch exclusive so it doesn't get a lot of love unfortunately i have been enjoying it for what i've been playing it for so far so you're telling me i need to not only get a switch but get this game too yes yes to both there we go yes i'll let that be left open to interpretation though they're not much needed but while i'm being challenged challenge in video games. Wendy, it seems like you've been looking at maybe taking a challenge yourself. I am looking at taking a challenge. After we had done episode 70, where we were talking all about the Pine Phone and the awesomeness that just is Pine 64 in itself, I'm probably butchering this, but Wolf Nick on the Discourse forums said, have you taken the Pine 64 challenge? And after taking this challenge, he talked about how just the way he talked about Pine 64 and his overall feelings of Pine 64 changed. And it sounded like for the better. Here are the rules to take the Pine Phone challenge. Before starting, prepare the Pine Phone for the challenge to the point where you feel reasonably confident. So this means that your service needs to to be working on the phone, any of the apps that you want to be using, go ahead and have them installed and ready to go, logged in, any of that stuff. Do your initial setup already. Now, for the next 48 hours, all of your calls and text messages will be taken on the Pine phone. There's some other stipulations to that. You need to receive at least three messages and or calls per day when you're not expecting them. So your phone can't be on at the time your phone has to be off, screen is black, phone's down, somewhere else. Then the Pine phone cannot be attached to the charger 24 seven. You actually have to use it like a regular device. It can't be just hanging out on the charger. Lastly, and this is probably what makes it easier for some people to get through this 48 hours, you can still use your Android phone, your iPhone as a Wi-Fi device for anything that isn't calling or text. So if there's certain things that you need, say media type stuff, so they're like streaming services that you can't necessarily get on your Pine phone, 
you can still use your other phone for those things. I absolutely love this challenge. I plan on taking the challenge. I've been trying to get my Pine phone set up. I spent a lot of time Saturday night while I was on the air with Big Daddy Linux. I wasn't really talking. They were talking about elementary OS 6. I haven't really played with that, but I did use that time to play with the Pine phone, trying to get it set up. So right now I'm having some issues in taking this challenge because I don't know if it's the current version of software that I have on my Pine phone. I don't know if it's necessarily some issues with my SIM card. I am on a CDMA network. And so right now it was reading my card, but I wasn't getting any service on my card. So I knew it was there. Like I had information in settings on the SIM. I just didn't have any service and I couldn't get an APN set up on the device. That is one thing that hoop that I need to jump through in order to take this challenge. But my goal hopefully this week is to finish getting that worked out and take this 48 hour Pine Phone challenge. Having done something similar now again different os of choice than obviously what you're going to land on i can basically do almost everything with ubuntu touch that i would need to do on my phone for the most part it's really weird when you kind of strip away all kind of like the ancillary stuff that you're used to be it from android or ios you know the other major platforms and you're like wow i really don't use a lot of apps <laughs> Yeah. I didn't realize how much I used it in the browser or how much the apps that I have are really just mobilized browser things. To me, that was actually really cool to see. I would probably do this, but unfortunately, I'm not sure the current status of the headphone jack, which I use quite frequently. There's issues with my current cell provider when it comes to the Pine phone, specifically with Ubuntu Touch. So I still have to yeah. wait on that stuff, unfortunately. Having used it as specifically how I do generically use my phone, I can definitely see it's a tough challenge, but it's not one that's not able to be accomplished. Right. It's only two days. Yeah, exactly. It's this weird thing. Like if you didn't have smartphones at one point, you can kind of learn to strip everything out of them and just kind of go back to basics. That's why I really like challenges like this because I was one of those guys that was, I was still holding onto a BlackBerry 10 device until they sunsetted a year and a half ago for support. Did everything I needed it to. That's all I cared about. And you find how few apps you actually used. <laughs> yeah, I really don't use that many on my phone. And there's apps that I couldn't necessarily get on my Pine phone. The workout program that I do is all app-based. You don't access any of it from the web browser. You access it from the app. The thing is, I have the app on my phone, but I also have it on my tablet. And when I'm actually doing my workout, I'm accessing it from the tablet anyway. I never do my workout out from the phone. So that's one that already doesn't need to be there. Yeah, exactly. It's just funny when you actually go back and it's like, oh, well, don't really need this. So the phone becomes more of a phone. What they're supposed to be is a phone. I do use mine for quite a bit of media. Audio books are an everyday part of my life. And it's one of those things. I don't know if I've mentioned it here before, but if I can't sleep or if I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't go back to sleep, I will. And this is where the headphone jack is super important, but I can still use my old phone as a media device. I just put in some earbuds and turn on an audiobook that I absolutely love, one that I've heard a bazillion times, so I already know the storyline, and I can just let all of my other worries or things that I'm thinking about just kind of melt away, and the audiobook lets me go back to sleep. I can still do that on that challenge because it's not telling you that you can't use your other device at all. It just can't be connected for phone and text. Take the challenge. I want to know how many of you out there are going to join me in taking the 48-hour Pine Phone Challenge. We'd like to continue the discussion with you on Telegram, in Discourse, Mumble, or Discord. Visit the DLN website for information on how to contact the social channels, all of our shows, and creators at DestinationLinux.network. You can find Nate at cubiclenate.com. Links to his regular written blatherings, podcast, and YouTube channel can be found there. You can follow my random ramblings on Twitter at MattDLN. You can find me on Mastodon at WendyDLN at Mastodon.online. Be sure to check out the DLN merch store. Grab yourself some awesome DLN Extend swag along with stuff from across the network. As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another awesome episode of DLN Extend. Until then, have a great week, everyone. Uh, 
Uh, just a minute. Pause just a second. It looks like we are possibly live on Twitch right now. Did I not turn off live stream stuff? I didn't turn off live stream stuff. <laughs> Whoopsie. Was it just Twitch or was it? Uh, it YouTube went to too? both, but I think YouTube was hopefully set to private. Because I didn't see it. Yeah, I didn't get a notification for YouTube. I don't want Twitter. I want Twitch. Oops, yep, yeah, Waymer's on here. Yeah, it's still saying live. We're not meaning to be live. Hi, guys. So I may have to stop the recording and restart it since I went ahead and turned off the stream keys. And we will go again. So, hi, everybody. I'm glad you got to hear us for a minute in our not actually supposed to be live show. And you can catch this later when it releases on Wednesday next week. Bye-bye. It better not be back to live. No, I don't see it live. It says offline. Okay. <laughs> Lamer, we need an unedited DLN extend always. <laughs> <laughs> no. Props the bit shady. I do like the comment. I almost said awesome soda again. You should just start saying that. I should just start saying that.